and a relatively large community. This leads to source confusion. It's a pretty severe source confusion. And what I mean when I'm talking about source confusion, I can show you. So this is the uh, this is the shallowest uh, blank survey from the Hermes survey. This is a FLS. It's two repeats. A repeat is jargon defining uh, when you look at a map in, in an orthogonal direction, so two scans. Right, so this is two scans times two, so four scans. You can see noise, you can see sources. The RMS of the map, 33 and a half. Now I'm going to a much deeper map. This is the UDS, uh, seven repeats. Notice that the, the, the noise went down. Fine. You can, you can see more sources, you can resolve more sources, maybe. Now, I, I go to the deepest blank field in the Hermes uh, survey, it's 10 times as deep. So you might, I don't know, you might expect to see a lot more sources and a lot more performance. Yeah, it's true. It, the, the noise properties are better, but what you're resolving is not really much more. So the point is that uh, when you're confusion limited, you get to a point where you integrate more, but you don't get more. So this is illustrated even better in this figure of uh, the map noise versus the integration one. Am I talking loud enough for you guys in the back? Yeah. <coughs> so this is a, a map noise versus integration time. What you expect is as as you integrate more and more, square root of time, right? And that's represented here by this red line. But in fact, what's happening is when you integrate more and more, you're asking to leave this blue line, which is the confusion noise. Level. So this is exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about confusion noise. Uh, at 250 microns, we'll say 20 milligenesis, and of course it's worse at 350 and 500. And then if you ask the question, what fraction of the total number of sources do we resolve, considering this 20 milligenesis? I use here a cumulative number count I took it from the Bethany model, which is good to data, so it's a really good estimate. Uh, cumulative number counts just means pick a point and say, how many sources do I have, do I have that are brighter than X? So here, how many, port, how many uh, sources do I have that are brighter than 100? So now, how many sources do I have that are brighter than 20 milligrams? <coughs> so you look here and you, you do math. It's about 0.3 sources per square hour. And then you can say, OK, let's go all the way down to the faintest thing that's a reasonable estimate <coughs> and ask how many sources do we have in this file. We have about 30 sources per square hour. So in other words, we're resolving approximately 1% of the total sources in the CID at the time. Okay, so my talk is about how to overcome confusion noise and to reach into that 99% of sources we'd otherwise miss. Uh, first, I'm going to discuss how to measure the clustering of galaxies uh, that <coughs> using, by using all of the information that's stored in the Next, I want to show how the fluxes of sources below the confusion noise floor can be measured on average by stacking. And I want to show that it can be done in an unbiased way, and it can be done in a map that has larger views. I want to uh, dissect the CID into the different contributions from galaxies of different masses and different ranges and different luminosities. And I want to end by discussing a new survey to extend uh, our understanding of the properties and distribution of dust step on the out. This survey here that I call first. Okay, so I'm going to present results from the uh, from, from Hermes. Hermes is the largest survey from uh, the Herschel Space Observatory. It uses spire and packs. It consists of a wedding cake, uh, wedding cake style survey. So that it has, you know, at the bottom it has very wide and very shallow maps. At the top it has very deep and very uh, small maps. It totals 380 square meters. It's a large collaboration and has worldwide parts worldwide participation. Uh, here I am, often confused with a friend of mine, Joaquin Vieira. So, when you see these papers, you can think of me, he does it with OK, so, the, why clustering of dusty star forming galaxies? Well, the most obvious reason is to measure the environments where star formation is triggered or quenched. Right? To understand the progenitors of today's massive mass ellipticals is a, a reason why it's been lower. It provides strong constraints for galaxy models. And then for people that do CMB, which I think there are a lot of the crowd, it's, uh, it's also a contaminant to the SA effect in many 
had the SF factors as the result of massive clusters. And thus the stuff from the galaxies may also trace massive clusters. And that relationship is not yet perfectly clear because massive halos also tend to punch stuff. So understanding that relationship is important. Okay, so what is clustering well uh, from Trino? The idea is very simple. Different types of galaxies trace the dark matter in different ways. And to measure that clustering, all you do is you measure the distances between those galaxies that you're interested in. And then you compare those, those distances uh, to the distances you would have got if you had just randomly placed these galaxies. And it's as simple as that. So the correlation function is measuring the distances and comparing them to random. And then when you have your measurement, you, it's been found historically that it's actually very well fit by a power. And that the strength of the clustering is, uh, is, is just the amplitude. Fine, so here's clustering uh, cartoon into, into, into the real world. This is from deep 2 See that the data is well fit by power laws and that the red galaxies are more strongly clustered than blue galaxies, for example. When you get to the point where your data quality is so good that um, you're no longer uh, satisfied with the power law, you actually have a justification to try and fit this thing with something physical, then uh, you can try and get it with the model, one of the models that is, is popular is the HALO model, which is itself actually quite simple. Uh, it says basically that the, 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 the clustering can be broken up into contributions from uh, the linear component. So these are galaxies that are occupying different like dark matter halos. And this uh, one halo uh, nonlinear component on small scales in, in excess, it's coming from different uh, galaxies that are occupying much more massive dark matter field as a side. Fine. But I tried to do this in the sub millimeter and you run into trouble. And the reason you run into trouble again is that source confusion, that nasty source confusion. So here is a uh, simulation that I made where on the left side I just took a, I took a map, I threw down sources <coughs> randomly, their fluxes were taken from a, a number count. Take the same map, convolve it by the And on the left side, I circle in green the 50 brightest sources in, in, in the map that I made. On the right side, I circle the 50 brightest sources that I recovered. Right, so remember, these are the 50 brightest. So you would expect that, that they won't be as uh, susceptible to, uh, to the bias and the confusion. But in fact, even for these 50 brightest in the course gray degrees, only 70% of the brightest were recovered. The ones that weren't were just a coming together, a random coming together of galaxies that uh, were blended together by the beam and fused into the source. So what's the big deal? Well, these are the, the, the 50 brightest. And if you want to measure the clustering, you want to measure the distances between uh, these things. But then these things are not actually these things because they are also these combinations of random galaxies come together. And I imagine that you don't want just the 50 brightest, but you actually want to go a bit deeper. And this, this problem becomes much more problematic. Then you are diluting your signal clustering with the signal of random. You're comparing some random to random, and you're diluting your signal. Right? Okay, so if you don't believe me, uh, this is uh, the Hubble. Uh, this is an, an image I took from the Hubble Deep Field, uh, and then this is the same image from from Spire to fifty mark thousand. I'm looking to convince you that I'm not pulling your leg. <laughs> These are just contours now. If you're curious, this, this source here in Spire was approximately 30 milligenses, so, so above that. Okay, so, well, this is actually what made it so difficult to measure clustering in blast, this effect, because I was getting no signal, and I didn't understand why. We, we had a field that was 40 times bigger than the previous biggest uh, sub-millimeter survey, which were shades, and, and I wasn't able to get a signal. You know, and so here I am, this uh, guy who's a mechanical engineer, and now I wanted to test the galaxies, and I'm surrounded by cosmologists, experimental cosmologists. And, uh, well, all hope was not lost. In fact, it, was, it, it turned out to be a great place to be, because being surrounded by cosmologists, they understand that there are some more information in the map than just the results. So this is, again, simulation. And on this right side, we just have only the sources that are greater than 20 million answers. And on the left side, you have the sources that are less than 20 million genesis. This is clustered 
So um, you can see that in the left side there's actually a pattern. There's some structure. And in this structure, there's information. So being surrounded by CMD people was ideal because they knew that uh, you could take the power spectrum of this map and you might have information. So here's a cartoon of what a power spectrum, a power spectrum of, of a, of a infrared background map would look like. This is the total power spectrum. It's broken up into, com into the components of the Poisson level, which is sensitive simply to the fact that uh, you are uh, discreetly sampling the back. This two halo term, same as before, but now the scales are inverted because the uh, larger scales are going this way. So this is the two halo large scale term from the galaxies occupying different mass uh, dark matter halos. This excess on small angular scales from galaxies occupying the same dark matter halo. Add it all together and you get this green line. So here's our, uh, so we want to do it, we want to do it with data. Uh, so this is some work that came out actually last week, or was it two weeks ago? Time flies. Uh, the, we did the work on five different fields, which were chosen because of their large sizes and also because of uh, their good galactic sears properties. The maps were made with SMAP. SMAP is a, is a Hermes uh, product. The total area is about 70 square degrees. And keep in mind for later that one of the things that we did was mask the brightest sources, you know, like this thing here. But we also masked progressively more aggressive. So we masked the brightest sources, and then we masked like 300 milligenses, and then 200, and then 100, and then and we wanted to see what effect that had on the power structure. Okay, so diving straight into the results. Here's the combined 250 micron power spectrum uh, after collecting, correcting for galactic spheres, which you mentioned. This is the, that Poisson level, the two halo term, and the one halo term. Okay, so here I've only uh, masked the extended sources. Same thing, but now the different colors represent the different levels of the mass. Okay, so stepping through it, The effect that masking has on the Poisson level was to be expected. Because as you mask brighter sources, your Poisson level should go down. <coughs> Here is uh, the, the Poisson level versus the masking level. So more aggressively masked is that way. right? And focus here on the circles. These are the data points. Notice that there's power already in this simple measurement. Because what is also here as a dashed lines are uh, phenomenological model from Bethlehem and all. So you can see that he's close, but he's not quite there. Also, the P of D number count measurements from Glenville, uh, they are not so sensitive to the, to the faint end, and they are slightly degenerate between the middle end and the right end. And this can provide a constraint that will help them in, uh, in making, nailing down that measurement. One. Slightly unexpected was, uh, was a, a decrease in the one halo power as well with mass. So as we mass more and more sources, this one halo term is going down. So remember that this one halo term originates from uh, galaxies occupying large dark matter halos as, as, a, as satellites. So now in here we have we have uh, a strong hint that the most uh, luminous galaxies. Through this slide in for you guys, because um, if you are interested in see uh, the the signal from from the SA power, well, keep in mind here that now this is in L squared scale, whereas before I was always showing it scales. So now the the Poisson is going that way. And if you are interested in this uh, SZ signal, then you, you want to go after it in the sweet spot here, before the plus one noise feels you and before the, the CMB feels So this range here between uh, 3,000 and 4,500 is really the place where you want to be going after it. But it's also the place where the, the one cable power has a significant contribution. 
So understanding that the behavior of these galaxies in this uh, one halo term is extremely important if you if, if your goal is to remove this power, to do it in a way that's actually real. Okay, so we've not only measured the power spectrum of each mass, so 250, 350, and 500 microns for all the different levels of masking. We also measured the cross-frequency power spectrum, so 250 uh, cross 350 and 250 cross 500 and so on. This, uh, this data set is incredibly powerful, right? Consider that each band is sensitive to different ratios. And the cross-correlation of these different bands is going to be sensitive not only to the ratio distribution, but also to the, to the color distribution. It places type constraints for future galaxy models, whether they are phenomenological or semi-animal. <clears throat> okay, uh, I just want to demonstrate the advancement on uh, previously published data. First, of all, I'd just like to point the fidelity, right? You're, you're going from half an arc minute all the way up to what, a degree and a half? And uh, zooming in on, on 250 microns, you can see that the blast results are kind of high. The, the, the first result from Spire on large scales was actually quite low. Now, this was an H paper. And this would be we are pretty confident now is, is due to the overcorrection of galactic spheres. Correction of galactic spheres was a matter Moving to 350 microns, and now we have, we're uh, able to compare to the measurements uh, done by Planck. On large scales, we agree rather well, whereas on uh, small scales, uh, there, 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 there appears to be a, a deviation between the two. I, I should point out, actually, that the reason you see two different color circles here is because I'm comparing the blast results and the Planck results to those that were masked the least aggressively. Whereas I'm comparing the spire results to those that were masked the most aggressively. And the reason is because I want to compare apples to apples. Right? And so when you are comparing uh, the Planck, you should be comparing the, the light blue. At 500 microns, this this uh, this deviation starts to become slightly more apparent, and the reason for it is still is still not clear. I, I want to point out here that uh, that uh, Planck does have very has a much better measurement on, on large angular scales, and you, you know you might instinctively say, well, well, of course that's true. I mean, it's Planck. It's all sky. But in fact, the, this Planck measurement was only done on uh, twice the area. About 140 square square degrees of compact surface. So this is 70. The, the, this, the difference in these air bars is not attributable to that. It's more because of the transfer function of the uh, of the S map made maps. Remember, it, it, this is a bolometer, so so the time streams are going like this. You have this one of ref noise, and you want to you want to get rid of that, but you want to get rid of that in a smart way, so you don't take out all of your large scale. But at some level, you have to take out some of your large scales. And then there's a couple of ways that you can get over this. One is that you can just scan faster, and then this will get better. So this uh, Lockman Swire and Seagate uh, Swire, two of those fields were actually scanned faster. So you can see through your eyes that, that the transfer function is better. And you can make the maps with an opt optimal map maker. So the S map is an iterative map maker, but it's not, it's not like a, a synchronous style optimal map maker. That instead, it takes more time. So measuring the transfer function is more it requires more labor. But you should be able to recover larger angular scales. So fine. With this in mind, because I'm obsessed with power structure, uh, we had some time with, with, with uh, Hermes to, 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 to do another survey. Of this, which just had left over time, and I proposed to go after this large scale power structure that we were, we were lacking by making a survey that was just designed to do it. So. The result is the uh, Hermes Large Mode Survey. I went to the people at the, uh, <coughs> the HSC and I, and, I, and I said, how long scan for this tank can I do? And they're like, oh, that's an interesting question. Is there a yes? So they came back with the answer. 16 degrees. Wow. 16 degrees it is. So this map is made up of scans of 16 degrees. This way and this way. So it's one degree, right? So as, as fast as possible.
possible as long as possible as big as possible. And the reason for this funny shape is because this this map here, this color map, is IRS 100 microns, which is a good tracer of galactic series. I wanted to put some over there. There wasn't much galactic series. And here is not really the, the best place in the sky, but the thing that it did was satisfy the people that were like large scale modes. Are you kidding me? Right. So we put it somewhere that had a lot of legacy value and a strike eight. So it was, a, it was a nice compromise. We can go after legacy, but we can also go after this large scale power structure. And how much better do we think we can do is if we're, we're cracking out in our own transfer function here at about a degree. We think that we can get out to you know almost 20 degrees. And at this point, you're completely dominated by your linear term, which is great. And you are sensitive to turnover in the matter power structure. So this here basically is one number to give you your bias, which is one. Okay, same power spectrum, but now I've removed the Poisson noise so that all I have is the power from cluster galaxy. Try to fit in the power law, you see that you do pretty well, but you are justified in trying to go out to the halo model. Now I'm going to run out of time if I go through this point by point. So briefly, I'm just going to say that we had the requirements in our payable model to try and take a step forward on what's been done before. And, and, and in fact, a lot of the double models have struggled <coughs> to do some very basic things. One of them is to fit all the spectra simultaneously. So there's one model to fit all the spectra. So far, the Shang are the only ones that have been able to do it. And we also wanted to take it one step further by fitting the, the number counts. And we didn't want to have a million parameters otherwise. And the success of the Shang model was, was, the, was that they found that if you use this luminosity mass relation, so the luminosity of the sources are actually related to the halo mass and not just completely independent like it was before, that you actually had a much uh, easier time fitting all of your spectra simultaneously. And what we did is we, for simplicity, we stuck with a single SCD template. So it's, it's described by two parameters, temperature and beta. Beta is the emissivity index. In total, we had seven three parameters. We found that when we tried to fit them all at the same time, we had some strong degeneracy. So we, we fixed the temperature and we fixed data. We had five three parameters. And this is the result that we got. It's actually quite pretty. Uh, 250, 350, and 500 microns. I'm only masking uh, 300 milligenses in this example. And the number counts are also fit uh, from the number counts of blended all, which were PMD. What did allow you to fix the temperature and data? Uh, or what were the priorities? Temperature is fixed to 34 degrees. So, I mean, we, we know those values well because we're saying it's very general, but we need to let them float just. If you let them float, yeah, the, the correlation between the two was like negative 0.99. That was, that was the strongest degeneracy by far. Okay, and. Uh, just to, to make the point here that we didn't just fit to the 300 milligenskis, we also fit simultaneously to the 50 milligenski cut spectra. What we didn't do is all the rest of them to save computing time. Also to save computing time, we didn't fit the, the cross spectra. But here, the cross spectra on the bottom. So these are predictions from the halo model that we got for what the cross spectrum should be. And the agreement is actually perfect. Not everything was rosy. Well, we had a chi spray that was about two, which was good, but not really great. Uh, we had a, an effective mass that was actually quite comparable to other to other uh, measurements of effective mass. But because the model is slightly different, it's actually quite difficult to compare these things. You know, what people call effective mass, what they call peak mass, and, and, and minimum mass, it sort of changes. What, what I should mention is that we had significant tension here in this, in this single SCD fit. This beta of 0.8, if, if you're into betas, it's very low. It should, you would expect it to be more like one and a half or two. And so the question is, what's going on? And we tried to figure it out, and we weren't exactly sure. And we think that it has something to do with, with the, the inability of such a simple model to fit uh, what we know to be a very strong evolution of the temperature of galaxies. And that's it. And so the next obvious thing to do would be, well, just don't use this one single SED because it's kind of, doesn't really make sense anyway. 
you know, that's not very realistic, but what would you use instead? Because the, the temperatures that you can measure with galaxies at high redshift, they tend to be least result galaxies, and you know that they are very rare events. So they're not what you would want to use. They're not necessarily what you want to do. So how can you measure this stuff? Okay, well, going on to the next part of my talk, I'm talking about now about how we can measure the stack, uh, the, the, the average submillimeter flux of galaxies using stack. Now, you're going to notice that I'm going to get into a lot of detail, and you might wonder why. And the reason is because I've heard people say, and I've heard people that I admire say, that you can't stack to inspire. You can't do what the beams do. do. You get a bias from the It's just impossible. I want to show that it's not true. You can do it, and I'm going to show you how it's done. So, we know that most sources lie below the confusion floor, but they can still contribute information to the map. What I have here is a 250 micron map, uh, where I stretch the color so that green is faint emission and blue is you know, less faint emission. And this, these white circles come from a catalog of K-selected sources at about a range of 1.2. Notice that basically nothing is resolved. Maybe this one, right? But that for most of them, if not all of them, rely on these areas of faint emission. Now what I'd like to do is, is imagine cutting out a thumbnail around each of these circles. Right? So imagine in your mind a thumbnail around each of these circles. It might look something like this, like thumbnails with nothing in them. But if you take all these things and you average them together, this is what is known as traditional thumbnail stack. This is, when people talk about stacking, they're usually talking about this, cutting out thumbnails, averaging it together and see what comes up. So do that. Keep in mind that I'm not masking anything, right? So, so things might pop in and out of the screen, but as they get uh, averaged out, they go away. And if you're skeptical, you might wonder about the potential bias of this extra stuff, particularly if it's clustered, right? Well, if it, turn, it turns out that if they are not clustered, if they are Poisson distributed on the scale of the beam and below, if and only, then there is no bias. And to prove that, I made a simulation of RAM. Can you explain the fact that you're showing that? You're just showing the cumulative uh, average? Yeah. And, and what do you have more and more? Well, you were stacking up a key band source. That's right. Yeah. I should have noticed it wasn't, because that was a key band source. No, the key band source is no, no, they weren't. That was a cheating because I had a pilot here, so it was a nice time. You would have got the same thing uh, if I didn't. Uh, is that crazy? Right. But you, know, you would have got the same thing if you stacked up the icon. <laughs> and how many, how many were there? In, in that example I showed you, I actually I, I showed you every five. I didn't show you one at a time because it was the five that's right. Yeah. Uh, so I showed every five and it ended up. Okay, so uh, the point that I was trying to make is if they are randomly oriented, and I did this with a simulation, I just randomly put stuff down and then, and then come over the beam and then uh, stack on those positions, I know what the flux should be. The ratio of the stacked flux versus the input flux is, uh, is here on the x-axis. So if the answer is one, then it's unbiased. Notice that no matter uh, what the size of the beam, you always got an unbiased answer. But what was different was that the error bars went up. Okay, fine. But so what? Because this is not really super. Galaxies are possible. We know this. But I want you to keep in mind that galaxies are rich at one and galaxies are rich at three. They don't know anything about each other. So the fact that they're uncorrelated, they do not bias each other. Keep this in mind. So what about when clustering is a problem? Here are three galaxies. Right? Involve them with the beam. Cut out thumbnails. Notice that uh, you have little bits and pieces from, from the other galaxies, uh, average them all together, and here you have a bias. <coughs> right? these, these contributions from the other galaxies are going to bias the result. So we've come up with a, with a technique that we call, for lack of creativity, simultaneous stacking. It's a formalism that was developed by uh, myself and Lorenzo Monchelsi, who helped that. It's not dissimilar from uh, that developed by Krasinski and Weiser and Rosemary Rose and all. But the, the, the methodology is slightly different. 
And it's actually kind of simple, so you might want to review the other You start with a catalog and a, and a blank map. And in that blank map, in each of the positions of the catalog, you put, put a one. I call this a hits map. Convolve your hits map with the PSF of your, of your instrument. And now in those places where you had that overlap, uh, that's taken into account in this convolved hits map. And then it's a simple regression between your convolved hits map and your sky map in, in order to find that the, the average flux of those galaxies in your in your original catalog. Okay, it's as simple as that. This cartoon obviously is very simplistic because yes, you have uh, galaxies, but you also have other galaxies, galaxies that you haven't encountered. They might be fainter or they might be whatever. And all of those different things cut together, put together are going to, are, are going to bias results if you don't account for it. But the simultaneous stacking technique can account for that if you know the, those galaxies. If you have those galaxies in your catalog, you can account for it. What you do is for each of those contributions that might be bias in result, make its own hit set. And so, I'll tell you what, 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 an example is exactly the one that we used was uh, we had a catalog we divided it up into masses. The galaxies at the same redshift with different masses cluster around each other. Right? But if I divide them into masses and I fit them simultaneously, so I take each of these uh, different mass hits maps, convolve each of them with a beam, then I simultaneously regress them. Just to fit the sky map, right? So look for that number that best fits these things multiplied together and sum, sum together to, to, to make your sky map, right? So here I think it gets a little bit complicated. And for people who like Lorenzo, who make my pictures and love matrices, uh, this, this, is all, uh, this, is, this is all formalized in, in, in math. Basically, if you're familiar with the traditional cluster uh, stacking, everyone's it's 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 a point here where uh, in a in a, five, in, a in an unclustered map the your off diagonals are zero in a clustered map they're not zero. Anyway, the technique once again is you take each of your things that would be clustered with with, with each other, make a hits map for each of those sub catalogs, convolve them by your beam, and then fit them simultaneously to find your stuff. To show the simultaneous stacking uh, technique in simulation, because you know we came up with the idea, but we want to make sure that it worked. Again, we have um, output, stacked output versus input on the x-axis. So one means unbiased, and on the y-axis I have source density. So down here I have not very many sources per square minute. Here I have lots and lots of sources per square minute. If uh, you have not that many sources and you have a very small beam, you don't have much of a bias when that comes out. If you have a very dense map and you have a very big beam and you have a very strong bias and that comes out, the simultaneous stacking uh, turns out to be unbiased in all situations. With the error bars, the only thing that are really very size of the beam. Okay, so I'd like to use this technique on real data to try and dissect the contributions from the CID to the optical from optical and near infrared observed galaxies. Keep in mind that there are an infinite number of ways to split this thing up. I, I, I gave you the example, and it's the example that we use is splitting it up into mass, but you might want to split it up into color, you might want to split it up into uh, slope of the, of, in, in the optical, right, on the, on the redness of your, of your galaxy, and so on and so on and so on. So what we've done is we've split, we've, we've taken a Mass selected catalog where it's uh, in the UDS, it has a K band magnitude cut of 2480, so it's actually quite deep. Over 0.6 uh, square degrees, so it's actually quite big for an optical, 54,000 sources. We use all of the different optical and uh, near infrared to fit SEDs to get the masses in the, in the redshifts using the easy code and the, the fast code. And then we took that and we stacked it on. Maps from Spitzer at 2470 and 160 micron, at Herschel at 253, 1500, and then the Aztec camera on Asti, which gave us a nice 30 second at 1.1 million. 
<laughs> okay, here's, uh, here's our results. What we have is each of the different bands. Back flux density versus redshift, and each of the colors represents different mass bits. Zoom in on 24 microns, and uh, notice that as it gets farther away with redshift, it gets fainter. Also, notice that the most massive are hard to give you the strongest signal. Move over to 250 microns, and we're finding now that uh, as you get farther in redshift, it's not dimming as fast. Classic negative peak correction in action. Also, notice that by the time we get to 1.2 millimeters, you get farther away and things are actually getting brighter. And these are the same galaxies, right? Different maps, same galaxies, so they are related to each other, they're correlated. Uh, we, can, we can fit an SED to these different points, and uh, something that I want to, I want to stress, but, but nobody seems to do this when they do stacking, is that these, these data points are correlated. There's confusion noise in each of these maps, and it's not different. So there is less weight in, these are not three independent points. They should not be treated as independent points when you're trying to fit something, when you're trying to fit an SMD. So the technique that we use to fit these SMDs actually takes that into account, and I wish more people to do anyway. So now for each of those examples that I showed you, you can fit an SMD. Here we have it in mass slices and in redshift slices. Again, just to remind you, uh, it's the, at each of the different redshifts, the different masses were stacked simultaneously. So everything in this row was stacked simultaneously. Everything in this row was stacked simultaneously. Right? But not everything was stacked simultaneously because things at redshift 1 don't know about things at redshift 3. Just zooming in to show some of these SED fits that we have. Uh, these dotted lines are the interquartile regions. These uh, black dotted lines are the best fit cherry and LBAS template. And the reason I show it is just for a sanity check, just to make sure that this very simple two parameter SED that we're fitting is, is consistent with some form of reality. So, what's some of the rest right now? Uh, the rest of the length you can get a, you can get an idea from these these lines here because the luminosity is the integral between eight microns rest frame and, uh, and eight thousand yeah, eight and a thousand microns rest frame. So this is eight microns. This these are the redshifts here, and then these are this is the most massive thing, the second most massive thing. Okay, and so uh, so here we have the that. An iteration of what I showed you before, they stacked uh, the total CIV and split it up into different redshift pins, look for the contribution from different redshifts, and we find that uh, we have, so this red line here is from uh, 0 to 1, and most of that flux is, is contributing at uh, lower wavelengths, and that from one to two, that shifts pretty significantly over to longer wavelengths. And this again is that negative peak correction reaction where we have longer wavelengths being more sensitive to uh, higher redshifts. And you can see that progression continuing as you go to uh, longer or higher redshifts. Right? Same thing uh, now with slicing up into, into mass contributions. Uh, notice that the most significant contribution to the, to the stack CIB is coming from this uh, middle mass range. Right? Because even though they weren't the most luminous, there's a lot more of them than there are of the very, very massive galaxies. These are stellar masses. These are stellar masses. Also keep in mind that uh, I'm showing you the results from star forming galaxies. We, we use the color selection, U minus B, B minus J, to separate the uh, star forming from the from the yes, capacity. Okay, and then in preparation, because the systematics is, are something that really uh, we have to work out, is the, the fraction of the total that we can get from our data. Okay, and uh, in the time that I have left, I want to talk about the, the HERS, the Herschel Redshift Survey. Uh, this is uh, 
an open time survey covering approximately 70 square degrees in a stripe in from the three spire bands. Uh, and I'm particularly proud of this because this is my baby. This is my I'll go through this quickly. Uh, originally conceived to go after the redshift distribution of the CID, uh, the models all agree that the CID peaks are around one. But after that, we got to What exactly is happening at high redshift is still unclear. What we hope to do with our what we with our proposal was to nail this down to, to greater than five C to get an idea of the um, of the redshift distribution of the CID at higher higher redshifts. Of course, there's a problem, and that problem is that we have foreground that peak CID. So this is just a silly uh, model that I put together to show what the CID looks like in, at around 0.9, what it looks like at 2.4. You can see that there's a significant foreground that you have to get over. What we need to do is we need to, again, rely on ancillary data. Ancillary data is the key. This time, though, as tracers of the dark matter at high redshift. Here's what I mean with the cartoon. Uh, we want these, these yellow galaxies, they are uh, very cheap for the one. But I'm dominated by foreground noise. <coughs> but if I know that these galaxies are tracing dark matter halos, and we can find other galaxies that reside in those same dark matter halos, traces of that dark matter, then by cross correlating them, we can, we can tease out that signal that we're after. Of course, there's a caveat, and the caveat is that you definitely need to know your tracer extremely well. And that's where HETEX comes in. HETEX is an uh, experiment uh, which is going after the BAO at high redshift. It's doing it by uh, doing a very large survey, uh, very large source density. It's going after line and out emitters. And it wants to be able to measure the bias to better than 2%. Herschel writes a survey that just arrived. The data was finished ta being taken less than, definitely less than a month or two weeks ago. We put the maps together pretty quickly. The SMAP team is, uh, at this point, pretty good at what they do. Uh, this is the 70 square degrees, so 22 by something like 3. Uh, this is Galactic Series, so our window. Take a look. Uh, this is the strike 82, so it's 2 degrees tall. Of course, there's a lot of other great data in this field. This yellow strip is the 3 degree tall axe strip. This, uh, this red box is the HEPTEX that the proposal was based on. And this blue box here is a IRAC Warren mission called SHIVA, which is actually finished taking data and they're also in the process of making maps. And they're going to be quite great. Also in the field, um, this is just me digging around and seeing what's out there. Uh, there are clusters. Uh, it's a really big cluster catalog from a key channel used using an algorithm in the optical to, to tease out clusters. There are the uh, boss just released D DR9, so the boss quasars. These are the guys that I stack. And uh, also there's uh, the DR1 and Wiggles, and I think the DR2 is coming up, although I really should talk to somebody to figure it out. But uh, there's already a little patch, and there, there'll definitely be a lot more. And really, the, the, the sky's the limit here. The, the Stripe 82 has CFH2. It's got uh, RCS, I can't remember the F. It's got really a lot of great stuff that, um, at this point, leaves us manpower. It leaves us, at some point, imagination. Whatever idea you think is a good idea, please come to me and talk to me, because I'm very interested in collaborations. So check out the website. Send me an email. Let me know what you think. Uh, just if you're curious how thumbs and curves are related, uh, this is a map uh, showing both of them. And this is 0, 0, our index. Strike 82 runs along this thing here. And there's, there's a tiny little bit of overlap. Uh, but yeah. Approximately 7 square degrees versus 208 square degrees. And all that great ancillary data. Okay, so in conclusion, I sort of ran out of time. But I want to. Rather than go through my bullet points, I want to actually talk to, talk to you about a little thing that I did because uh, I was more really curious. I wanted to see how many papers out there were doing what I'm calling map-based versus catalog-based. So I went into EDS and I put Herschel 
and it was a huge list came up. So I discarded all the ones that were about the lack of experience, and I discarded all the ones that were about noise properties and the detectors and so on and so on. I just wanted to get down to which ones were doing extra proactive work based on catalogs. So which ones were taking catalogs and measuring the correlation function and taking them and measuring SMEs and blah blah blah. And which ones were using the whole map or using ancillary data, using some sort of stacking or some sort of PD or some sort of power structure. I found that 86% of the papers were this catalog based. And 99% of the or 14% of the papers were map based. And considering that 99% of those sources are below that confusion limit, so they're not going to show up in the catalog. Though it's hard to argue that the results are very interesting. They're lens, they're bright monsters, they're whatever they are. As we are finished picking the low hanging fruit from this very interesting partial data that's come out, and we want to take this legacy data and we want to extract all the signs we possibly can, we should think as a community about it. Digging into these map based things to try and get all that information. Thanks. Okay, I'm ready one round of more questions. Can you go back about four slides? Sure. Uh, can you remember which one it was? The fitting. Something like this. Okay. So the model seems to fit very well uh, for the fact that starting from about uh, one thousand micro. So the model of the big uh, high emission uh, Here. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, the that? this is these lines. You know, we can go into all the details. I mean, these are the stack fluxes um, corrected for. No, sure, I understand. But uh, what these lines are are what I'm doing is I'm actually reversing out the. Uh, best fit to be. So it's not it's not a perfect algorithm. Yet. And I think that because there is a very uh, fixed parameters in this SCD right now, this is the best fit for it all this And then there might also be systematics here that we're still waiting for. So yeah, this is still in preparation. More questions? It's cute though, huh? Work. <laughs> Just my eye, bad luck, pretty close to it. Yeah. The measurements are the fraction of the background. Yeah. Pretty high. I, I, I wish you gave you a number, but I'm myself not sure that I can do it. So. <laughs> Good question. Separate 
red because it's dusty, from red because it's dead. So it's a technique that we're pretty confident about. Start stacking all the other colors. See what you get. Wait for those to go around. Blow your mind. We have, and it's actually quite exciting. But I'm not going to show that because I don't want to be right. Okay, so Marco is going to be around uh, today and tomorrow, and I guess we should go up to so some cookies, but let's thank him again.